In this video, we're going to look at the basic concept of a limiting reactant. It's a term that I've used before, and you've maybe kind of seen it pop up in some of these other stoichiometry problems. In a reaction, we often don't have the perfect stoichiometric ratio of reactants. There's often extra of something, which means that the other reactant will run out. The reactant that we consume first is called the limiting reactant. It limits the amount of product that can be formed. It limits the amount of reactant that gets used. It limits the time that the reaction can run. It basically runs the show. So we're very concerned with determining the limiting reactant. Which reactant will run out first? That's the one that especially determines the amount of product I can form. The excess reactant is not completely used up. And now sometimes this is a good thing. In some reactions, we may have one like real expensive reactant. Like maybe there's a silver compound or something. And I want to make sure that all that silver compound gets used up. I want to make sure it all gets reacted. Well, then I'll put the other reactant in excess. Because then I know I'm going to have enough of the second reactant to ensure that all the silver compound gets used up. Often in a combustion, we have excess oxygen, which is a fine thing. It's a good thing. We want to make sure that we completely burn the carbon compound. And there's plenty of oxygen available in the air. So we could burn these compounds all day long. But we're going to run out of whatever our compound is, our organic compound, leaving oxygen in excess. If by chance we take away the oxygen source and make oxygen the limiting reactant, then the combustion stops, and we can't burn any more of our compound. So conceptually, I should know the relationship between a limiting reactant and an excess reactant. And we're going to apply that to kind of a particle model here. The AP curriculum changed a little bit uh, in the last year or so. And they're real big into particle models and having you visualize what's happening on a small scale, which is kind of what we're going to do here. We've got this reaction for the formation of ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen. What if we had five molecules of nitrogen reacting with nine molecules of hydrogen? Would this be a perfect stoichiometric ratio? So again, we realistically couldn't work with five and nine molecules in the lab, but it's a number that we can kind of visualize in our head on a small scale. So what if that's what I have? I have uh, five molecules of nitrogen, and I have nine molecules of hydrogen. And now I look at the ratio from the balanced equation. That ratio is correct. Whenever nitrogen and hydrogen react to form ammonia, it has to be a one to three ratio of particles. Now, we often think about this as a ratio of moles if we're going in the lab. But on a smaller scale, we can think of it as a one to three ratio of molecules. So just do a quick check. Is five and nine a one to three ratio? And I think most of us would say, absolutely not. No, we don't have a stoichiometric ratio, which means we're going to have a limiting and an excess reactant. If this would have been like a perfect 5 to 15 ratio, then everybody gets reacted and there is no limiting or excess reactant. Sometimes that happens, but more often not. We do not have the perfect ratio. So we need to determine which is the limiting reactant. Now, sometimes you can do this by inspection which maybe you can do with this because it's an easy ratio, a 1 to 3 ratio. If it's something kind of goofy, like maybe it's a 2 to 3 or a 4 to 5 ratio, then you're probably going to want to show a little work. If you can determine the limiting reactant without showing calculations and they ask you to justify your answer, all you got to do is write a sentence. So most of us could probably do this one without a lot of heavy calculations. But if you can't, here's what you're thinking. You pick one reactant. It doesn't matter which. Let's say I pick that five. Look at this. I'm going to use MOL to abbreviate molecule. But that would be the same as moles. So usually we would be using this as a certain amount of moles. Uh, that's nitrogen. Let's say we want to use up all the nitrogen. 
we want to react five molecules or moles of nitrogen. How much hydrogen would I need? So we'll cancel the one that we picked and we'll switch it to the opposite, the hydrogen. We'll plug in the ratio three to one. Ooh, this is tough. 15. Now, you know, here's kind of the difference between math and science sometimes. You know, in math, that might be the right answer. 15, done. And I know that most of us are in such advanced math that this is very, very simple. Like a baby could do this. But you really have to understand what these numbers mean in chemistry because we're applying it to a larger picture. 15 molecules is what I need. If I wanted to react five moles of nitrogen, I need three times as much hydrogen. Now I do a comparison of what I have versus what I need. This is what I have. I have nine. I need 15. I don't have enough. That's my limiting reactant. Hydrogen becomes my limiting reactant. I don't have enough. Now, sometimes people don't believe me. You could do this with either reactant. And again, maybe I would only show this work if it was kind of a goofy ratio and I couldn't figure it out in my head. What if you picked the nine molecules or moles of hydrogen? And you say, let's react it all. Let's use up all the hydrogen. How much of the other reactant do I need? So you cancel the one you pick and switch it to the opposite. You plug in the ratio, one to three. And again, this is very difficult math. Three molecules of nitrogen or moles is the amount that I would need. So we do a comparison. I need three. I have five. I have extra. I have more than what I need. So that just confirms that this is my excess reactant. Whoa, come back to me. My ER is thinking, thinking real hard. My ER. There we go. So again, if I needed to show work, that's kind of what I'm thinking. If it says, what is the limiting reactant? What is the excess? Justify your answer. With ratios and numbers this simple, you can just explain that. You could maybe say, uh, we would have needed 15 molecules of hydrogen. We only have nine. We don't have enough. That's the limiting reactant. That shows that you understand conceptually how to figure out the limiting and the excess. They're always going to ask for some kind of justification, whether you use a sentence or you use a calculation. Because if somebody does it all in their head and just says, oh, the limiting reactant, that's the hydrogen. Maybe you really were smart enough to figure that out in your head. But if they say justify your answer, you have to show something so that the grader knows you didn't just guess or you didn't copy off of somebody else. Okay, so we got the limiting, we got the excess. How much of the excess reactant will be reacted? Okay, well, we kind of asked, uh, answered that actually. Whenever you do calculations... We'll do this as a calculation. We always want to start with the limiting reactant. The limiting reactant runs the show. It determines how much product can be formed, but it also determines how much of the other reactant will get used or reacted. So if I wanted to show work, I would do something like this. Uh, the limiting reactant is that nine molecules or moles of hydrogen. Note two, that the limiting reactant is not guaranteed to be like the smaller of these two amounts. No, you really have to take into consideration the ratio. I have more hydrogen, but I need more hydrogen. And in fact, I need three times as much, and I don't have that. That's kind of a common first-year mistake where they'll just look at those amounts and be like, oh, five is smaller. That must be my limiting reactant. Only if it's a one-to-one -one ratio, which it's not. So we're going to start here with our limiting reactant. When we compare amounts in these reactions, we're always starting with the limiting reactant. Then we just do a quick switch. We'll cancel moles of the limiting reactant. 
moles of hydrogen and we'll switch it to moles of nitrogen. Again, this is very tricky. It's a one to three ratio, which gives me that three moles of nitrogen. Now we're just gonna look at it in a little different light. How much of the excess will be reacted? Three. Here in this first step, I wrote it as what I need. Well, I definitely have that amount. So that's all going to get reacted. We're going to react three moles of nitrogen. However, let's jump ahead a little bit. Down in this last set, it asks how much of the excess reactant will remain unreacted. That's a simple subtraction. OK, so let's look at this. Unreacted. I have three molecules or three moles of that nitrogen. Oopsie, a five. Hello. Five. We're going to subtract the amount that gets reacted. We're only going to react two. Oh, hello, three. Good Lord, I can't subtract. Three. The difference is two. There should be two moles or two molecules of nitrogen in excess. So yeah, something with these simple numbers, we could have just subtracted in our head. But that's what I'm thinking. I'm going to do a subtraction, what I have minus what I react. The difference is just the amount that's excess. We should have two molecules of nitrogen that don't get reacted in any way. We can apply the same concept to the other question. How many molecules of ammonia can be formed? And I, these are easy numbers and easy ratios, but if I were working with larger quantities or a goofy ratio or maybe some fractions, decimals, I would set it up starting with the limiting reactant. I always start with the limiting reactant, the hydrogen. It runs the show, determines how much of the other reactant gets used, and how much of the product gets formed. So this time, we'll just set up a little switch. We'll cancel the hydrogen, and we'll switch it to the product, the ammonia. We'll apply the ratio from the balanced equation. This should be a 2 to 1 ratio. And we should have, oopsie, a 2 to 3 ratio. Hello. 2 to 3 ratio, which should give us a whopping 6. And that's the ammonia formed. So here's kind of my answers for this last one. I should be able to form six molecules or six moles of ammonia. And I should have two nitrogen excess. Now, sometimes they'll have you walk through this numerically, but sometimes they're going to ask you to do it visually. They might give you a picture of a mixture. And they'll say, here's like my initial mixture of ammonia and nitrogen. And they'll say like A, B, C, D, good multiple choice question. Mm -hmm. Which of the following shows the correct ratio of products? And often what people miss is that something might be unreacted. There might be something in excess and you can't forget that. So here's one simple way of, of solving a problem like this by grouping. If I look at the ratio from the balanced equation, I always need one nitrogen for every three hydrogen. Now, hydrogen atoms are smaller than nitrogen, so they're trying to show these little guys, these little guys, as the hydrogen, and this bigger molecule is the nitrogen. So go through and see how many times can I group that together. One nitrogen, three hydrogen. One nitrogen, three hydrogen. One to three ratio, nitrogen to hydrogen. I can group that together three times. For every group of one nitrogen and three hydrogen, I should get two ammonia. Here they are. Two ammonia, two ammonia, two ammonia for a total of six. And maybe the most important thing or what people miss most often, these two extra nitrogen. 
it's a great multiple choice question. It's something that you're probably going to see. They've been going to a lot of this particle model stuff. They want to know, like, conceptually, do you understand this? Not just can you plug this all in your calculator, but do you understand the ratios in a balanced equation, how they work together, and that things might not react completely. I do have extra nitrogen in this case, so the nitrogen is still present, but it's not changed in any way.